Okay, so the other thing we have in chapter 10, which is a, a second general equilibrium model, is one of a pure exchange economy for which we use an Edgeworth box. Edgeworth box is a really, really powerful way to visualize uh, what's going on in an economy, especially in what we know as a, a pure exchange economy. Now, uh, it, I'm going to do two videos on this. The first part is going to, first one is going to be simply on how we go about constructing the box. Okay, so what we have here is uh, what I've drawn is uh, for two goods, my two favorite goods here, pizza and diet Mountain Dew. Uh, what we have would be the axes on which we could have two different consumers uh, budget line and, and difference curve diagrams. So if you think of those budget line and difference curve diagrams that we had back in, in, in chapter three, take one, take one for each of two different people. And what we'll do here is in this economy with the Edgeworth box, uh, with the Edgeworth box, what we have is a uh, two-person pure exchange economy. So what we're going to do is assume we have quantities of two different goods that can be traded between the two people. So how are those quantities there? Well, I mean, if you want to think of the uh, the story of Robinson Crusoe, and, and Robinson Crusoe and Friday on their island, on their, on their island, maybe they have like bananas and coconuts, and they, they just happen to be there, uh, they're, they're nature's bounty, and they can trade them back and forth. Um, in, in this case here, and not, probably the better way to think about it for this model here is that production's already occurred. So the production part of it has already occurred. Now we're just going to think about how it is that uh, the people are going to trade things. So we're not going to have any production there occurring in this model, but we are going to eventually uh, be able to use the Edgeworth box to think about competitive equilibrium and uh, to find something that is Pareto efficiency, which is a very powerful concept. But first we've got to figure out how we're going to make the box. So uh, we have these two diagrams for the two different people, and we could have in difference curves and uh, Let's not worry about a budget line yet, but we can have a difference curve for Ann, and then I'll, let's see, I'll make some here that would be a little typically sloped for uh, Bill. So each of them have their diagrams here, and we could have considered them separately. We only like looked at like one consumer back in chapter three. Now we're going to assume that we have two people in our economy. So we, this is the other thing we're going to have here is a, a two person, two good pure exchange economy. So it's a very, very simple economy, but still the box is very, very powerful for helping us uh, see what might be going on. Now, what are we going to do to make this box? Uh, if we know how much of the, the two goods we're going to have, of each good that we're going to have in our economy, because this is a pure exchange economy, well, we have to make note of that. So Let's say we have a given amount of pizza, we'll call that P bar. That's the total amount of pizza between the two people that's available in our economy, the number of slices or, or, or you know, actual pizzas that they have. And then uh, we'll call this Diet Mountain Dew. There's a quantity of Diet Mountain Dew that will be available. So maybe it might be something like, oh, they have uh, you know, 15 slices of pizza. And they have a 12 pack, 12 units of Diet Mountain Dew, 12 cans of Diet Mountain Dew. And so that's the quantity of these two, of each of the two goods that would be available in our economy. So then what we're going to do to think about what we do to create the box is we're going to take Bill's diagram, pick, it's as if we're going to take Bill's graph here, pick it up, turn it over and set it down on top of Ann's graph. So we're going to have these axes here, which you know are down here with a, a corner in the, the bottom left hand corner. When we turn this upside down, this uh, this uh, this point here, this uh I guess the the right angle will go up and be over here in, on the box. So what we'll be doing is, in effect, taking Bill's diagram around here, and we're going to fit it on here like this. Another way of thinking about it is like, well, maybe we're just going to have Bill stand on the ceiling. And so now with Bill standing on the ceiling, he's looking at this diagram here. And, and this just is exactly the way he, you know, we, we would be looking at it here on, on this diagram. So we will put Diamond Dew for Bill over here. 
And, and that will work because as we've turned this over with this uh, corner, with this right angle going up here, this would be the vertical axis that, where that bill would be looking at here. It would be over here. So we would have Diet Mountain Dew on this, on this uh, axis. And then we would have pizza on the horizontal axis. And what was the horizontal axis here with this uh, corner? If it's here, then this is the, the horizontal. This is still the horizontal axis. So we have pizza over here. So this, the numbers on this axis would be Bill. I don't write. Bill's now up here because we again flipped him over on his, uh, flipped his graph over on his head, and Bill's origin is up here. Ann's origin is down here. We would have quantities of pizza for Bill along this axis because this was his pizza axis here. And uh, the Diet Mountain Dew, Bill's Diet Mountain Dew axis is now here. Ann's Diet Mountain Dew axis is over here. Ann's pizza axis is down here. When we turn Bill's diagram over and we go to set it down on Ann's diagram, we have to make sure we set it in the right place. And the right place would be based on these quantities here. We would want to make sure that we set this so that Bill's Diet Mountain Dew axis comes down here and intersects Ann's at whatever the quantity of pizza uh, is, that is available in our economy. So if we said that that was 15, we would have to make sure we would have to make sure that as we turn, you know, you think of it, we've turned Bill's uh, diagram on its uh, upside down, and we're just trying to position it. And where do we want to position it? Well, we want to make sure we position it so that this axis comes through. This uh, Diet Mountain Dew axis for Bill comes through and intersects Ann's pizza axis at the quantity 15, which is what we said was the, the, quant the available quantity of, of uh, pizza in the economy. And then we want to make sure that Bill's pizza axis intersects Ann's pizza axis over here at the quantity. Or Bill's pizza axis intersects Ann's Diet Mountain Dew axis at the quantity of Diet Mountain Dew that's available. And then I said that that was 12. So we have that there. So that the, the, the quantities that are available in the economy or the total amounts of these two goods, these two consumption goods that are available, set the size of the box. So the, uh, the, the total endowment or the total amount of these goods that would be available uh, give us the dimensions of the box. And when we have this here, uh, Bill's indifference curves will have come around and now be set on top of here as well. So Bill would have his uh, indifference curves on here, except if you want to think about how they look like, you see here we have his uh, indifference curves. Well, he still has normal shaped indifference curves, but from his standpoint there, Bill's indifference curves would look something like this. The indifference curves that were here, if you think of again, just to putting them upside down, Bill's indifference curves would be in here. So we'd say like this would be indifference curve for Bill. And then the ones that we're used to seeing would be for Ann. And there we have it. We've got the box. This is how we would go about constructing that drift box. So they have another video when we actually would use this here to think about Braille optimality.